Welcome everybody back, Steve Cunningham with Sense Fidelity. I'm coming with another book review, this time The Seraphic Order with special guests Fr Friar Anthony and Ryan Grant, of course, of Mediastics Press, who's publishing the book. So welcome, gentlemen, Friar. Friar, what is this book about? You're, you're, this is one of your favorites from what I'm understanding. Uh, you read it all the time. Uh, what What's the deal with this? Well, it's a, it's just, I mean, in a way, it's like those other kind of saint books. You get a saint every day, but it's a bit different. It, it, it's only dealing with seraphic saints. So you have all the big name saints that we know about. So for 360 days of the year, 365 days of the year, you've got a different either saint venerable or a servant of God. Um, and then some who have been proclaimed that, but they actually haven't had an official process you know, that's been there. You have the normal first order, second order, first order being the friar, second order being the court players. And then you'll have the third order, which sometimes is religious, that like the religious women had a third order. They might've had schools or there were missionaries or things like that. And then the third order secular, where you had the, um, the lay people um, and the amazing things that they did, just the heroic lives they lived, simply taking care of their families or, or, or whatever. So you have a, a very concise, you know, concisely written but very interesting uh, rosé of the saint and then when that finishes you have these three considerations it's a reflection on something particular whether it had to do with that saint or something that saint exemplified like the other day we put up on your channel that uh it was um mary of agreda mm -hmm. and it's mary of agreda she died on the uh, on pentecost at nine o'clock, when in choir they were singing the Veni Creator Spiritu, uh, Spiritu. So they, they gave the reflection at that time had to be, they gave the reflection on the Holy Ghost, on Pentecost, and on um, the, the graces and, and things like that. So it tends to have some kind of either a moral section and it asks questions, so it challenges you. But I found it's very um, providential the way it works out. Like it, it always kind of brings something up that's been in conversation or you've been reflecting on yourself or somebody's struggling with. So in, in the friary, right after Compline, when we, when we sing Compline, at the end, the very last act that we have for the day is I pull out the Franciscan Book of Saints. Now that Ryan Grant's going to, you know, Mediatrix Press is going to put it out. It's called the Seraphic Order. Very interested to see the book. Uh, and we just, it's the older edition. They have newer editions of it, but this is the, what is it, Ryan? The, it's written in the, the last updated in the 50s, I think, right? 1959 is the publication date of this volume, and that itself is just a an augmentation of the 1930s volume, Pavarello's Roundtable, by Sister Aquinas Barth, if I'm not mistaken, that was her name. Uh, I might be mistaken on her last name, Sister Aquinas uh, something, but uh, so she had put together the work, Pavarello's Roundtable, and then in the 50s, Father Marion Habig who's a Franciscan scholar, he increased the, uh, the work and, and the nature of the meditations and added a good number of saints. And, and then he also had a list of, of saints that, um, or, or at least um, venerated Franciscans that Sister uh, Aquinas wanted to get into the entire work and just wasn't able to because there were, you know, so many different, uh, you know, the actual canon, actually canonized saints are the ones she wanted to put in, although she did manage to get in a few who are venerated um, like uh, Jacopo the Todi and, and others who are venerated in the order, although they're not formally beatified by the church. So, you know, so anyway, so you have all those figures. So it's according to the calendar of the extraordinary form. Um, and so that we're using that 1959 edition because um, that one's out of copyright. So that's the, um, you know, so it's kind of a natural demarcation. <laughs> it's it, right at that time. And it's what's wonderful too about it is Father Habig notes in his introduction that uh, there's so many Saint Franciscan saints because they try so uh, with with such zeal to emulate the life of their holy founder of Saint Francis himself, and so that the book can be somewhat of a, a textbook on Franciscan spirituality. Hmm. And uh, so I wonder, brother, if you could uh, kind of enlarge on that uh, point that Father Habig brings out that uh, this book as a kind of a, a guide even to, to everything there is to know about Franciscan spirituality. Huh. Yeah, what, it, it, I mean, obviously we learn, we, we learn the lives, 
the, the most perfect way to emulate the saints by reading about the saints. Well, all the spiritual theologians say that every Christian should be doing spiritual reading every day. And essentially they say, just rip through books. I mean, don't rip through them in the sense you're not paying attention to them, but you're going from one life of a saint to another life of a saint. And we're not reading it out of curiosity. We're reading the life of the saint because we're looking at those things that they did and that they suffered, and we're, we're seeing how they coped with it and how they constantly attained higher and higher in their spiritual life. And so the beauty of this book is, is the way they wrote it. They're bringing those things out. They're showing how a Christian who wants to arrive at the goal that is heaven, that they live a life that sometimes is very, very difficult. And so this brings out the fact that there's a couple of things this, this book always brings out, or at least the, the way they write the lives of the saints. Almost always, they were raised by pious parents. Almost always. Which today, the young men get discouraged because they say, well, I, I don't come from that. But, but what it is, it should be, it should be for, for parents to, to take this and read this to their children so they can at least show them and start learning that they, they need to be pious themselves if they want their children to become saints, which is their job. That's why they got married. That's why they have offspring. It's to raise them for God and have them go to heaven so that we can fill heaven up for the love of God. But the first thing you read in almost every, every first paragraph of these saints is, almost always, not always, raised by pious parents to be a devout child. And so they, they started on the, the road of virtue at the very beginning, and they just kept following that road of virtue. What their parents gave them was a love of Christ. Gave them a love of Christ. And that's where the Franciscan spirituality comes in. St. Francis loved Christ, and he wanted to follow him in absolutely every way until he became Christ. And that's what St. Bonaventure shows. He did that so perfectly that Christ stamped the wounds of his uh, of our redemption into St. Francis' flesh. This is what we all strive. We're not asking, we're not all hoping to become like Padre Pio and get the stigmata, but we want that mark uh, that, that shows that we were true sons of St. Francis, that we were true uh, imitators of Christ. Even the Pope's Leo the Thirteenth says, and he brings that 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 quote of um, Saint Paul, and he applies it to Saint Francis, and he says that we should all be imitators of Saint Francis. He doesn't say Franciscans should all be imitators of Saint Francis. He said all Christians should be imitators of Saint Francis. As Saint Paul said, we should all be imitators of himself. That's because Saint Francis perfectly imitated Christ, and that's what the spiritual life is. Unfortunately, we don't do that much, and that's why. That's why these kind of books are good, because they start showing us the right direction. I would say for parents, it gives you, if you hear it over and over again, because you're reading this to your children at nighttime, it's going to be even more for them, because that, those, um, those beautiful reflections that are put in there, they're deeply theological. There's, there's really beautiful nuggets in there that are so simply put that you understand them and you're able to put them into practice. They'll put you to shame because you realize that you're never putting them into practice. But they're there so that we can put them into practice. And so what the parents start to see is they're reading this to their children, but it starts to give them the tools that they need to live the virtue that their children need to see, not just hear. And so I think this is what um, the good father that put this together, it, it, the whole essence of Franciscanism, the whole charism or um, uh, patrimony of the Franciscan order is simply that we exist because we want to make Christ present in our own lives by perfect imitation of him, and that's why we follow St. Francis. But the good that that has for the world is that we can try to make, hopefully we don't fail at it, but we can try to make Christ present to everybody wherever we go because we made him first present to ourselves by, by immolation, by imitating him perfectly and destroying in ourselves the old man living the new man, which is supposed to be Christ and, and him crucified. So, the way the book is written and the way the reflections are there, that they're, you're reading about the life of the saint, and then there's some catechetical point, some um, some meditative reflection, but they end a lot of these paragraphs, like I said, there's three paragraphs for these reflections after the saint. Not always, but they almost always end with a question, like, and have you thought about that? And do you live that way? And it really strikes you, and you're like, well, no, I, I don't, I don't. Uh, and it's to show that, well, you're not going to arrive. You're not going to arrive where these saints have arrived, which is your duty. You're not going to arrive there because you're not thinking about that. So it's to strike our conscience and give us the ability to start 
pushing for. Hey, Friar, would you think of it as a Butler's Lives of the Saints meets the liturgical year of Don Garanger meets Divine Providence? Maybe, I don't know. <laughs> the way you were talking about just kind of like a Live of the Saints every day and then you're throwing in a theological thing at the end of the stories? I know, well, I mean, it follows the liturgical calendar, but we wouldn't notice it completely following that because what you have the servants of God who never heard of some of these people, though they're, they're remarkable individuals and they've lived things that are very similar to what we've lived. Uh, very, very, uh, very seldom do we find days lining up where you have the liturgical calendar. For, like we've seen Claire coming tomorrow and that lines up perfectly in the old calendar. Um, and, and like St. Bonaventure, that lines up perfectly. St. Francis and so on. The, the bigger saints line up perfectly. So according to the seraphic order, yes, we're following the liturgical calendar that leads us through. But most people aren't going to find that at Mass. These, most of the, the liturgies that we as friars um, are celebrating in the um, office, in the divine office, we show up at the parish and they're not they're not having that mass nobody's celebrating that saint we would have that in the friary but we wouldn't you wouldn't find that anywhere else so you're not so much getting a sense of um the liturgical year by don garanger but personally i I, th I think that the book stands on its own you get a very piously written page and a half sometimes even a half a page of of the life of a saint very pertinent information about things that they suffered, backlash that they had, uh, things they had to overcome, illnesses that they, they had crippled them and put them in bed and how they overcame it. Um, and, and then you get this moral section afterwards that really doctrinally is extremely sound. Like you don't hear this stuff anymore. You read it, you're so edified by the fact that, you know, it, it just it just doesn't have problems with it. Like nowadays you, you read something, you're always kind of like, well, I mean, you can kind of say that, but if you say it the wrong way, it isn't that way. This is just very clear and solid doctrine that you always know because when it, it kind of sets your heart on fire, the doctrine, you know it's, it's good stuff. And that's what you find here. There's no compromising. There's no patting you on the head like you're a puppy saying, oh, don't worry that you're not living this way. And it's also not beating you up. It's just saying, it's just kind of challenging you a little bit and then pointing a finger on the direction you need to start going. I don't know if, if you would agree with that, Ryan. But. Well, I certainly would. Um, and, if I, I'd be, and that's the way it is with all the religious orders, that they have um, you know, their own saints that are of their own calendar, and some that doesn't really make too much of a difference because they're all, you know, um, so much is the same with it. They're just using the Roman calendar, and so that they'll just add a little extra thing for themselves. Um, but say for the Dominicans, Franciscans, the Benedictines, the, the monastic office, um, Cistercians as well, they all have this, you know, their calendar, which, you know, nourishes, uh, supposed to nourish their particular orders. And so with the, with uh, this particular book, um, which we've retitled the Seraphic Order, it, it gives that nice, that window into, basically into the friary that you could take away with you, almost like in the spirit of the Third Order Secular, that uh, you're now imbibing the, the spirituality of the Franciscans. And even if you're not, particularly if you're not a third order Franciscan, you're not particularly given to that charism. I, I'm particularly more Benedictine and leaning towards becoming an oblate, but I love this book. And because of, you know, the, because Francis, when you, when you get it down to it, um, he is very much, uh, you know, al almost a certain simulacra of Christ. He's very much molded into the very image even the circumstances of his life divine providence and organized in a certain way to lead um you know being born in the manger or again um you know he wanted to die uh, you know up in the hill where criminals were put to death and and other things like that that saint bonaventure and uh, and others relate in their in their lives of, of saint francis and so anyone is imbibing the spirit of saint francis is imbibing the you know very much the you know the model of jesus christ essentially in the church and there, there's so much in terms of that the history that uh you know just like in the dream francis gets that or uh, not francis pope innocent the third gets that dream you know where where the whole church is falling down and he looks and uh you know francis is holding it up okay? and so very much it becomes it's kind of like a turning point in the history of the church which brought that 
that life and that brand, that new energy. And, and uh, you know, to, and basically to all the orders, St. Robert Bellarmine, who was a Jesuit, uh, absolutely loved St. Francis. And he had St. Francis in mind in one of his household exhortations where he says that the lives of the saints are the best commentary on scripture. And he was actually born on uh, St. Robert, uh, St. Francis' feast day, St. Robert Bellarmine was. Oh, yeah. He knew he would die on uh, the day that he always had this providence about him where he would see kind of the, uh, have a sense about how things would turn out with, uh, you know, events. He refused to call it providential, but it really was. There's no way he could have known these things have been right so often. And he predicted he would die on um, the feast of the, the stigmata of St. Francis. Oh, yeah. And so because he, he knew, foreknew that was going to happen at some point, he didn't know what year, but he knew the day, then he, um, he actually worked when he was in the Congregation of Rites to get that on the Roman calendar. And it was on the general Roman calendar until uh, until the the 1969 uh, the, the ordinary form of the mass was put out. So it uh, you know so that was something that even as a Jesuit he would breathed the very air that Saint Francis had breathed in Umbria in very much his spirit also. So, but I wondered uh, since it is Saint Saint Clair's feast day tomorrow, uh, why don't you talk a little bit about Saint Clair? And how she's presented in the book, and what people can expect to find if they read the book, and you know, on you know, this or that saint. Well, they can tune in tomorrow too. We'll be publishing the uh, a beautiful reading of it with fancy music. <laughs> <laughs> so Saint Clair, uh, well, we we know that she's they consider her like the first true child of Saint Francis, and she came to Saint Francis, and this this often happens. You first have a male group that starts up and then women start being drawn to that spirituality. But it wasn't until recently that you could have men and women living together for some kind of spirituality. And we know that never works out. But so St. Francis saw the spirit in her, this desire for poverty, the desire to live Christ crucified. She wanted to throw off, she was a very attractive young lady from a very good family. And she heard St. Francis preach in San Rufino, the cathedral there, built just a little bit before St. Francis was born, uh, there in Assisi. St. Clair lived just right outside, basically in that piazza um, there. And she was just enraptured by this, this um, man of the Beatitudes, as St. Francis was. He was also referred to as like um, the risen Christ. That's what the way they saw him uh, in, that, in that time period. That's the way the popes have talked about him in their encyclicals. And so in seeing that, she she wanted that, so she fled basically her family, just like Saint Alphonse says. If you're gonna, you know, don't he, he says for your vocation, keep it a secret and you know, flee to your vocation if, if need be. And so she does that. And she goes to the Portiuncula, that uh, beautiful little chapel that was dedicated to Our Lady, where Saint Francis really received uh, from Our Lady. He, con he conceived uh, in himself. Our Lady conceived in him the evangelical truth, the, the gospel truth, is what Bonaventure says. And she went to that place where St. Francis risked a lot because the families back then, they come after you. You just took the daughter. They would have married her to somebody. That would have made their family more powerful. So St. Francis, thinking about God and not uh, human you know, respect, he, he cut her hair off and he put her, he clothed her in a habit. Uh, then he put her with some Benedictines and finally it just wasn't working. They were trying to force the Benedictine spirituality on St. Clair. When she, like St. Francis knew, we're not called to be well, it's a little bit different, but we weren't called to live that kind of life. So St. Clair knew she needed real poverty. Benedictines live a, a very a very beautiful religious life, but they own everything that they have. They, they work for what they're, they have to take care of themselves. She wanted to live completely on the providence of God, and that they wouldn't let her do. And she fought tooth and nail with the Pope himself, who she knew, and she worked miracles in front of the Pope. Uh, and finally, after all that, they finally gave her her way, which she saw that happen just right before she died. But the beauty of St. Clair, this complementarity, because there's complementarity between men and women. Society doesn't want you to know that anymore, but and that's, that's the way that God made the male and female, only called the man, right? So you see it in these two beautifully chaste individuals and this love that they had for each other. St. Francis would want to see, or St. Clair and the sisters wanted to see St. Francis is what it was. He would actually intentionally not go to see them if he went to go like once they asked him to come speak to them and saint francis had such a high respect for the, the the spouses of christ he would never look at them the only person he said before he died there was two women that he probably could say what they looked like one was well, he didn't say who they were but it was probably saint Clair and jacoba 
the, the, the friar lady from Rome. And so that he once he went to go preach to them, and he didn't say anything. He walked in the middle of the choir. He, I think he stripped off some of his clothes, sprinkled ashes on himself, and he sat down and wept or something like that. I'm probably getting it all wrong, but it's basically that. And then he just got it. He did a miserere. He recited the miserere, and then he left. And it left him something to think about. Well, once him and St. Clair came together, they wanted to have a meal. And this is portrayed in the little flowers of St. Francis. And they had this little meal. I don't even know if they ever said anything. It was just the love of God completely filled the room to the point where the villagers saw that the house where they were at was on fire. And they all came running to put, running to put the fire out. And all as it was, was they found all of them there enjoying the love of God. Hmm. Each other's company. So it wasn't like Brother Sutton and Sister Moon then. They were just uh, <laughs> hanging out in a nice... Uh, <laughs> but at the end, place. would you see that complementarity between the two? If Christ was that perfect Im if, if St. Francis was that perfect image of, that perfect imitator of Jesus Christ, St. Clair became that perfect imitator or imitatrix of uh, the Blessed Virgin. And at her death, uh, they talk about this, Our Lady was seen, because they had that upper room. At that point in time, all the sisters would stay in um, a dormitory. They were all there, and St. Clair had hers over in the corner. Um, and she'd been very sickly for a long time. She was abbess for like 38 years. Uh, she's the patroness of television because they would put a hole in the floor so she could watch Mass, and also because once she saw uh, from a long distance Mass being done, she was given a, a special miracle. But... As she's there lying, she's dying, she's in the last hour, Our Lady came over and they said Our Lady kind of descended on her until you couldn't tell the difference between St. Clair and the Blessed Virgin. That's how perfectly united Our, La Our Lady and St. Clair became. Now St. Clair became a perfect image of the Blessed Virgin and St. Francis became a perfect image of our dear Blessed Lord. Um, and that's where that, you see that beautiful complementarity. So St. Clair did, and, and I think in a, in, a more, in a more difficult way, she had to live poverty, the heroic poverty in a monastery where they, how do you live that in a monastery unless somebody goes and begs for you? It really takes a higher level of courage to be able to live the heroic providential poverty of St. Francis in a monastery where you're not allowed to leave. They did have different, it wasn't so strict back then, but still you weren't allowed to just go begging. The sisters didn't go like the today because enclosure wasn't brought in until after the council needs. of trent what's that was well, enclosure wasn't brought in until after the council of trent okay so that there was the sisters going around and begging and things like that because they would still send friars out to beg but then you had problems with the friars whatever so it, it took something very heroic but even when the pope himself was saying no she just wouldn't she wouldn't back down until the end she got her way at the very end so let's talk about this this uh, business of poverty, the extreme poverty in the spirit of uh, St. Francis, because this leads to quite a few problems down the road uh, in terms of the the mitigations of the rule, the attempts to restore it, and which uh, are a continual thing. Um, and you see, uh, you know, the Collatines, you see then later the Capuchins, you see, and always it's it's the attempt to rediscover, recover, I should say, this this radical poverty of St. Francis which so often gets mitigated by the church, like John XXIII, uh, Nicholas V, and so on and so forth. So let's, uh, what is the radical ideal of poverty preached by St. Francis to which he had exhorted um, and, and had in his original rule for his friars to follow? And how does that fare over the ages? Well, I'm no expert on anything, but I think that in, in trying to form the men here in authentic Franciscan spirituality, the essence of it goes down to actually being detached from things. Not, not just saying, hey, we can have stuff and be detached. I'm not trying to say that in the least bit. But, but that we're not, a, like St. Bonaventure really did have to bring, people will criticize St. Bonaventure and say he was somebody that was revolutionizing. And I just think that that's, that's a pile of garbage. I mean, St. Francis really did have an idea that maybe didn't come to complete fulfillment, but he had an individualistic kind of idea, not, not in a negative sense, but in the sense of he lived in a time, and you probably know more about this than I do, but that the medieval man was somebody who lived in a collective society. You, you fit into a society that, that functioned a certain way. St. Francis had this idea that 
there's a type of individualism that, that, that God wants to bring out of you to, to bring you to your level of sanctity. Well, once the order grew to a certain size, they couldn't think that way. They couldn't understand that anymore. They needed rules, and they needed rules that fit into the canonical structure that they had, both secular and religious of that day. See, Francis didn't fit into any of those rules, just like his idea for religious life didn't fit into any of those rules. He wasn't a monastic, but he was a strict contemplative. He was a contemplative that walked around doing exactly what Christ did. He is an apostolic contemplative. So with the poverty that he had, uh, I'm at a loss on how we're to recreate the poverty of St. Francis if it's not through absolute detachment from everything. Meaning, we don't sell anything, and nor do we ask for money, unless it's, you know, you know, you need money today. But that paper stuff, that green paper stuff that they give us, has a zero value. It has zero value. But that's what I have to use to pay the water bill, right? Then you might say, well, you're a Franciscan. Why do you have water? Well, I don't know, because I, I can't have a well in the middle of the sea. They're not going to let me do that. I mean, we, have to, we have to use common sense when it comes to this stuff today, too. The only way we can actually understand it is we have to live like Christ did and be absolutely and completely detached from everything. We have to be detached from, if I get sick, I have to be detached from the fact that, hey, I can reach out and hope that a benefactor will take care of me and God will provide somebody. But if he doesn't, I have to be willing to die. I have to be willing to allow myself, because God can take care of everything. But if he doesn't put a, a providentially somebody there, I don't have rights to go out and start saying, I'm sick, somebody has to take care of me. I'm hungry, somebody must feed me. No, no, we, we want to live like the poor Christ. And he said that whatever you do for the least of my brethren, you do to me. A majority of our poverty really is the fact that we give the opportunity for people to receive the blessing of Christ. Whatever you did for the least of them, you did to me. And that's why you received the kingdom. That, that becomes a blessing to him. That's why St. Francis, one of the reasons St. Francis wanted to be poor, he didn't desire just to live destitute. St. Francis desired to have, he, he, desired, he desired to be like a butterfly. Now, I don't mean that in the sense that we talk about bunnies and deers and all the kind of nature stuff today. But butterflies, if you ever sat and watched a butterfly for a long time, they have no thought. They just... They'll fly around in no pattern at all, land on something, and they'll be there for a while, and then they'll start going around again. This is kind of the life of man on earth. But if they're detached from what they're doing and all they're striving for is heaven and doing God's goodwill, then you don't care what you're doing. So in a way, you're fluttering around like a butterfly, going from God's will to God's will to God's will, and not thinking about what do I have to do next. A man that has to think about what he has to do next has to provide for himself to get that thing next. Someone who has no attachment in this world whatsoever is willing to risk everything at any moment for the love of God, and nobody can stop them. Franciscans, I hate to say it because somebody might see this and then they're going to try to shut me down. Franciscans are unstoppable because they, they don't care. They, they, they want to do God's will, and it affects them when they don't have what they need. It hurts, and it's difficult, but they're, they're indifferent to it because Christ didn't have what he needed all the time. He didn't find a place to sleep. He didn't, he, his food was to do the work of his father. And the list goes on and on and on. But if God, if the God man himself is to take flesh and live on this earth and not have what he needed, then that's the glory of man. You should seek what the most glorious man that ever lived did. And that's what a Franciscan seeks in poverty. They seek to do what the glorious God man did. He lived in poverty. This is the ideal of St. Francis. Not to, not to dig a pit in, in, in our house to bury our food. I mean, the house we moved into, because the bishop told us to live here, has a refrigerator, so I just use it. I mean, I'm not gonna turn the refrigerator off and go dig a pit, it's not my house. So it's not necessarily trying to strive to be destitute, the destitution of St. Francis. Who talks about the destitution of St. Francis? It's to have no attachment to the things of this world and to accept from the hand of God what he believes we need. And if we don't have what we need, then we're free to go and beg at the table of the Lord. That's to go door to door and ask, for the love of God, do you have anything to share with the friars? So Ryan, uh, Ryan um, how can people detach the book from your warehouse to get it for themselves? And right. also, you said it was 1959. Are any of the saints post-59 in it? 
No, they're mentioned uh, afterward. I thought about it, but they have a saint literally for all 365 days of the year. And so it came down to the integrity of the work. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, I mean, it might be something for a future book if somebody wants to write a supplement. Um, and, and I thought about it. St. Maximilian Colby, for example, is mentioned in the appendix because his, you know, his cause is pending, but he's not actually in the book because um, they already had somebody else there. And so you know, it was rather recent. The, um, you know, and, and of course, and unlike, say, uh, some other figures like Don Scotus or Jacopo de Todi, that he doesn't have like a long tradition of veneration in the order because he'd only just died about 10 years before the book was written or so. So it was so looking at that, it, it was possible to do one because there certainly there have been martyrs, there have been saints, there have been, um, you know, holy Franciscans in the world. And uh, it might be like a good project for an appendix. But in terms of this work, I didn't want to start changing it around because I said, oh, well, everyone loves St. Maximum Colby. We should stick something in here. And I just thought that we should keep the work as it was. And the only thing I've done is really spruce up the layout and uh, made the pages a bit wider, try to you know get it under a thousand pages, which I think I just barely did. I have to check with the appendix when I finished the appendix. but. Um, so yeah, I think, and there's also a good appendix in there about Franciscan feasts and whatnot. And um, so I also wanted to kind of buttress what uh, Pryor was saying about, um, you know, that, that detachment from things. There's a great story in uh, one of the lives of St. Francis, at least by uh, Life and Legends by Kandid Shalit, which we also sell, right? To be allowed the shameless plug, um, where Francis and, brother, and Father Leo were walking and you know the father leo had seen a bag of money on the road and then he, he kept quiet about it and then they kept walking on the long way and then finally father leo says well hey uh we did just pass that bag of money there we could use it to help the poor or something and francis kind of you know ignored him and then you know father leo continued to entreat him um, about it and then you know you know francis said oh we should pay it no mind and then finally he said but, but think of what good we could accomplish with this so finally St. Francis says, all right, since you're so keen about it, let's go back. So they go back to, to the crossroads where they'd seen the bag of money. And now all of a sudden, Father Leo's having a bit of trepidation about it. He's not so sure. He actually wants to go and grab it. And St. Francis says, well, since you thought this was so important, why don't you reach out to grab it? And so now he gets kind of nervous, actually. And he reaches out to grab it, and a serpent crawls out of the bag. And it's empty. <laughs> And then St. Francis uses it to, to explain basically his principle, you know, you, you saw the money and you wanted to get it, but we should be detached even from, you know, from this and take everything that God gives to us and not, not worry about a bag of money, you know, laying on the side of the road. You know, if God meant it for us, it'd be given right into our hands. So the, the um, and also just the general detachment from money because that becomes quite the problem. You know, and, and of course, for those living in the world, it's also a big problem and, um, I know I have uh, seven kids, one in heaven, but uh, six here and one on the way. So it, uh, there is, it definitely need money. And, you know, all things being equal, I'd say, <laughs> what do I need that for? I, I'm just going to do this. But kids got to eat. I got to pay bills. I got to pay bluffing. And, of course, we're living in a rented property. So, again, I can't dig a hole in the ground either. <laughs> and uh, any, any more so than, than somebody else. But at the same time, I can still be detached from it. Mm -hmm. I can still say, well, you know, what do we need to, to provide for things? And, uh, okay, I'll put this much in the, you know, the poor box and this much here. And at present, I can pay, you know, my employees a little extra here and so on and so forth. Re you know, and those are the ways that w in the world, and that's also one of the things that uh, you'll buy from, you know, this particular book, because there's not only the first order regular, the, uh, the Friars Minor, or the Friars Minor Capuchins, uh, there's not merely the poor clares, the second order of St. Francis. There's not merely the third order regulars. There's also the third order secular monarchs and average men that uh, came into you know, the order and started you know, picking up the spirit of St. Francis. And in so doing, you know, learned these principles of detachment. And so speaking of that, actually, if we could, um, uh, Friar, if I could pick your brain, there's uh, on Monday, there's a St. It was in the third order secular, uh, St. Roque. And I've since we're in dealing with these unprecedented times uh, with, uh, well, illnesses and other such things about the world. Uh, yeah. You know, St. Roque is the patron of plague. Why don't we talk a little bit about him? Well, it's real interesting. When you read about these plagues from um, 
the, the plagues they dealt with and the plagues we deal with are completely <laughs> The other book you put out on St. Charles' Zetsay, I can put plugs in for you, Ryan, but that Thank you. book of St. Charles' Zetsay, he, they had a plague there. You read about it, and you're just walking through this. There you go. You're just walking through the streets, seeing people on carts that are dead. I mean, it was that's how bad it was. So our plague. Uh, our plague, was, we go to Home Depot. Yeah, that's right. We go to Home Depot. <laughs> Do we have to wait in line? That's how bad it is. So when uh, so Rock, he was a, he was a beautiful figure. He came from uh, Monte Pillar in, in France. He was born of a noble family. Same thing. Parents raised him in a very pious way right parents died later on he was actually his prophesied he, he was born with a cross on his on his breast a red cross was born his birthmark and so his parents died he was left with a huge uh, inheritance he sold it all off uh, took care of people that he had to take care of and became a third order franciscan a second or third order franciscan donned the habit of a pilgrim they had their own habit you didn't just it wasn't like pilgrimage today where you put on a baseball cap and a and a you know vacation shirt and you go to the five-star restaurants he went on a real pilgrimage or you could see he was a pilgrim and on his way down from france there was a certain road that you take all the way down and that road passed down through before you're when you're coming close to to rome you're still a few days walk from rome you pass a town called aqua pedente the, the, the trail goes right through the or the road goes right through the middle of the city it's a beautiful little town it's a very little town a plague had struck in that uh, or stricken that that town, and so he stopped. Most people just fled the town. That's what we would do, right? We, you hear somebody that has a cough, and we presume they have coronavirus, and you just run for your life or get a face mask or something, a shield and everything. So he he what did he do? He went to the local hospital, and he started to nurse the sick until it had abated. The entire plague had abated, and then he picked up his staff again and continued on. By the time he got to Rome another plague. So while he was also visiting the Tomb of the Apostles and praying at the different shrines, remember he wasn't on vacation, he was on pilgrimage to pray at their shrines, he would also go and spend his time at the hospital. Same thing St. Francis did when he went to Rome, and he would go and nurse the sick at the hospital. Once that had finished, he, he packed up and went off again. By the time he got to Piacenza, uh, outside of Rome, a place he'd already been, and we have to remember St. Rock was so holy already that he would make the sign of the cross over people. And he wasn't a priest. They make the sign of the cross over people, and they were healed from their their affliction. God can heal us from these things. It's not all just a natural. This is what happens when we die and buy into all the evolution stuff. We we start to forget that God can actually heal us from stuff. So when he went to there, he's he finds himself stricken at Piacen, Piacenza. He finds himself stricken with the plague. Goes to the hospital, and they throw him out. He had healed people there, he had, he had helped the sick there, and they threw him out. Now, we're a culture that's always, we're wounded, we're all wounded, we've been wounded from this and from that. The saints, they go through all this. What does Rock do? He doesn't curse them or say, but I was here, I did all this, you didn't. No, no, he goes off into the forest like a dog to die, finds a nice little place that our Lord provided for him. He bedded down basically on some straw in a nice little safe place. And how does God work? Well, God sent a dog to bring him food brought him bread every day and he was able to eat he he got he got better and then he picked up his staff and he went home by the time he got home a war had broken out they take him as a spy because he's emaciated his hair is probably all crazy he's all dirty he finally gets to his home and his uncle they take him to his uncle his uncle doesn't recognize they throw him in jail what does he say does he say oh, I'm, I'm your grandson i'm, I'm your nephew I, I live here i'm, I'm do you I'm, know I'm, who i am <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, dude. He didn't say anything. Why? Because he was imitating our Lord, who never opened his mouth. And so he got put in jail for a week, two weeks. He got put in jail for five years. And it wasn't, he didn't say anything for five years. He was rotting away in jail. They forgot he was there until he felt like he was dying. So he called for a priest. The priest came and received the sacraments and he died. And where he died, by the hand of God, it was like a placard written in gold letters on the wall above his head, and it was just saying, "This is this is uh, Roach." All the time, I don't know what it said, but who, who you know, uh, intercession to him will heal the sick or something from plagues or something like that. So they called the his uncle, who was the the landlord there, or the the governor or whatever, and brought people. The, and the grandmother, his wife, um, 
identified the body because of the cross, and they realized they put their own grandson or nephew into the, into the prison. But it's a beautiful example of a saint who did good and didn't expect anybody to do good to them. It's a, something to reflect on in our lives. We expect everybody to do good to us, and when they don't, we're wounded and we're hurt and we, ha- we can't get over it. Instead, you see the saints, the way they react, they just imitate Christ unto death. Because after death, if you imitate Christ, you go to heaven. So to even shorten this life isn't a big problem. You get to go to heaven. Then after that, there's a, there's a reflection on there that they have just about, um, it's about him being the, the patron against contagious diseases. And so that's something we could probably learn a lot from today because, you know, we're scared to death. Um, but do we need to be scared to death? That's what saints teach us. Brian, why is that that important that you brought that up? Well, one of the things that uh, we're going to be doing at Mediatrix Press in tandem with the launch of this book, although I don't know if I'll have all the copies in place right away, um, is that uh, we're starting a, I guess for now we're just calling it a book club, but it's kind of a little bit more than that. So, um, Why am I thinking reading Rainbow right now? Uh, hey, that, the old version of that was actually a cool show. Oh, yeah, we uh, watched it. <laughs> any of it. So what we're doing, though, is that uh, so it's going to be a subscription based service. There's going to be tiers of I think uh, kind of the current target is $50 a month. And then we're going to bring that down. So that's going to get you a whole number of things. So one of which is going to be early access to books that we're publishing. Uh, and uh, so you'll get them like a month or whatever we come up with before anybody else does. But uh, we said, well, why do I do that? I'll just buy the book instead of the fifty dollars. But there's also there's other things you're going to uh, get for that. So besides this book, this wonderful Franciscan work that's working on the traditional calendar, and it's great for your spiritual life every day. So uh, so this is something that you'll get as part of being in the club. Um, you'll get a uh, every month you'll get a book, and that'll be hardcover as part of being you know in the club. And uh, it is but like I said, it's a monthly subscription. Uh, not yearly and we will eventually bring lower tiers and things once we kind of work out the bugs with it so it's also going to include um you know community input there's going to be podcasts there's going to be the whole ebook library audiobooks is a big thing we're expanding out into and so audiobooks are something that you'll be getting uh part as part of your subscription every month i mean at first and just some chapters because we're still getting it all built up but once it's all built up those are things you'll be getting access to as part of the subscription service and um you know and then at some point we're going to be having um a you know a live interview like a like in a zoom type of thing with this and kind of like a q a answer things from the mailbag take live questions and and that sort of thing and as well as have guests uh such as fryer uh here if he's willing um and then um, you know other people that i've had uh, that i've interviewed in the past we'll see you know who's in I mean, we've got a few people that are interested so um, you know, bring in guests and uh, other interviews that will be kind of exclusive to this service. So, and one more thing I got to say in this vein is that I tried to start something like this a couple of years ago on Patreon. And at first it worked really well. And then it just kind of petered out. And then, um, uh, you know, I <laughs> never produced the podcast. I never produced the, you know, it's a number of the things I was supposed to do. So then people who remember that might now be saying, Okay, so we tried this before. What's going to be different this time? So the difference this time is I'm not actually running it. Actually, my uh, managing editor is running all of this stuff. And, uh, and he's responsible for things like the new Mediatrix Express website and so many of the other projects that we're now embarking on. And unlike me, he's very organized and very focused. And he'll basically sit down and put it in my calendar, whether I like it or not. Okay, it's such a day we're recording this podcast for your book club. Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> and so on and so forth. And so that, so if you were a part of that old Patreon and you're wondering, well, why will this be any different and why do you want me to pay more? Um, you, you know, the, this is why it's actually going to, to be successful this time. Very good. How do uh, people sign up for that when it, come, when it gets launched? Is there a – go to the website? Uh, Mediatrix Press, there's going to be um, a special call to action when you uh, log in. Um, or when you go to the page, actually, it'll be – so it'll be there. I'm not sure where yet because we haven't built the landing page for it just yet, but it's going up. The launch date is August 17th, which is next Monday, right after our Blessed Lady's uh, Feast Day, uh, the Assumption, this weekend. 
and so it, um yeah that's that's basically the the beginning so to kind of recap that so that this book that we've been talking about today the franciscan book of saints that'll be available shortly uh, just waiting for the proof copy on that then um you'll be getting books as part of the subscription and hardcover we'll be having interaction with the uh, podcast with um you know guests and interviews and uh you know other things that we're going to be doing for it uh the audiobook access and lastly we're going to be working towards building an online community uh associated with the press to support the press and basically to support the dissemination of the catholic faith so it also will help us keep the lights on this building it has to be rented um i've got to pay my managing editor <laughs> he, he took a he has his devotion to this type of work as such he took a significant pay cut to work for me from what he used to make and his talents are, are far beyond anything i can conceive of when it comes to computers and software and everything else so yeah, and so he's done a tremendous amount of work for me already so it helps me to keep him employed and it helps uh, me to feed my kids you know as people always come up and ask well, why, oh if i give you money you're just gonna go spend it on tobacco and it's like no 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 when you give money through these types of things it's going to pay like specifically bills outlined through the press and then but yeah i am gonna buy tobacco but usually i actually have a benefactor who gives money for that purpose and you got a guy for that already <laughs> so if you're not not a big if you're not really big into my particular hobbies on that that's fine because your money's not actually going to that so you can you know relax very good. I'll include that in uh, next week's uh, Sense of Fidelium uh, newsletter that I sent out on Sunday. So the link will be there it's just in case anybody forgets to go there go, to go to the website along with the video. Uh, Friar, Ryan, any final words? I've yeah, let Friar go. <laughs> <laughs> I would say I would say select chapters of this book we're going to be doing like i said we're going to be doing the audio somebody's reading it we've already put two up on your on your site there'll be one up for saint Clair tomorrow they're only about seven minutes long but they're, they're they're edifying to listen to so we're trying to make them so they're uh, they're good quality so if people are interested they can tune in they'll be published on your channel i think in the mornings the day of the saint so very good we'll have friars we'll website underneath too We'll do. We'll we'll get all of them over the next couple of years. We'll do so many every month until we get them all. So. Awesome, gentlemen, Friar. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. <laughs>